That was in my 38 <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> Which you didn't read, like a knife into the heart. <laughs> Welcome back to What You'll Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Stephen Joseph Jones. Dr. Carl. Mate, what a legend. <laughs> Mate, what an absolute <laughs> he's, legend. He's actually the, the best person I've ever met. I, I love Dr. Carl. Mate, that's a big call, but I wouldn't disagree. He's a, he was just like, he is like, if you've ever seen him on TV or heard him on the radio, that's who he is in person. Mm. Um, he's just super curious, uh, a little bit kooky, but in the best way possible. Yep. Mate, I... He's probably the smartest man I've ever met as well. He just he just knows so much shit. It seems like everything, everything he's read and written, he just remembers. Yep. Like, you throw any question at him and he's almost always got the answer. And if he doesn't, he'll honestly say, I don't know, I'll look it up. Yeah, and I love it. It is really is exactly how he is off air as well. Yeah. You know, we're just sitting having coffee and then coffee came up and he'll yeah. go on a rant about <laughs> coffee or rant about the Victorian grid system yeah. and so on. <laughs> got into me a few times. But... Oh, definitely. <laughs> Mate, he ripped into it, but I think because he, I think he's, he saw something in you. He you knows you, you can change the world, mate. So he wants to, he wants to encourage you in, uh, by giving you a little bit of shit but keep you on track. Mate, the funniest bit was him stacking the dishwasher. He got an absolutely perfect stack um, after the interview. He fits so much stuff into one small dishwasher. Yeah, and he, and he let out a little... <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit too excited as it, as it just slotted in. It was an impressive stack. But yeah, he's a legend. So um, We didn't say it. Yeah, he's, so he's done 43 books. So it's all about science. Um, and making it uh, accessible and digestible for Joe Blows who don't know anything about science. Yeah, which is, yeah, us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dr. Cal. Cal! Dr. Carl. Good morning, Dr. Adam and Dr. Adam. Thank you for making <laughs> not, it easy because you know I have trouble with faces and names. I've got prosopagnosia. <laughs> can't pick the difference. Yeah. Fantastic. So you just released number 43. Book number Carl 43. Carl Universe and everything. Yep. There's everything in there. Um, no. no. <laughs> it's a slightly lying title. In fact, the weird thing about title is, in fact, trying to deflect um, from the fact that I'm telling a lie on the cover, is that um, titles are not copyrightable. Mm. Mm. So I can actually call this book Stranger Things, the Titanic, or anything I want. So yeah. titles are not copyrightable. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, yeah, before we get into the book, bef- yeah. you just offered us a coffee, and you're in the <laughs> middle of explaining why I shouldn't have quit coffee or why it is a bad health choice. So can you continue or just start on on why coffee why is so good that? for us? Yeah. Um, okay, well, firstly, a bit of a background. Uh, the legend is that some Abyssinian goat herder noticed that his <laughs> goats became rather frisky after eating these little berries. Around that time, the Islamic religion was making inroads, but it had both a... Prohibition on alcohol, but they also had people who would give long, boring religious talks. This is common to every religion. And so to keep themselves awake, they'd take the coffee. And then from there, it gradually made its way across into Europe. So what we have is a drug with a history with the human race of about one and a half thousand years. And overwhelmingly, it seems to be not just not bad for you, but actually good. (laughs) And the way it's good for you is that it improves your life expectancy and it improves your outcomes if you have liver disease or prostate cancer. Now, you you both know that you're going to have prostate cancer. Mm. Do you know that? What's the percentage of blokes getting prostate cancer? About 100%. (laughs) Oh, what? (laughs) You just have to be low, but it won't kill you. Yeah. Is that right? I never knew that. Oh, it won't kill you. I thought it was like 50%. No, it's close to 100% if you live long enough, but it won't kill you. You'll die of something else, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And also it improves the outcome with liver disease and with type 2 diabetes and with skin and oral cancers, but this is based purely on what they call observational studies. Mm -hmm. So this is not... The study where you get group A, group B, they're identical twins, they live in identical lifestyles, and one bit has coffee, the other, the other group does uh-huh. not. But it's observational. As an example, the American nurses study, where they get a third of a million American nurses and then follow them for a third of a century. And then gradually, things bubble up to the surface, like... If they smoke cigarettes, they don't live as long. If they do exercise and they're not overweight, they live longer. And, you know, mm. the thing is, correlation is not causation. 
but they're mm. finding these things bubbling out out of these observational uh, studies. And there's enough of them that among the dietitians, the overwhelming feeling is that for most people, the vast majority of people, uh, coffee's not bad for you. If, there's, if you're going to give up something, to become healthy, don't give up coffee, but it can have <laughs> bad effects. So if you have so much that is interfering with your sleep or you're drinking so much liquid that you go into the bathroom at night, or in my yeah. wife's case, we were driving across New Zealand and she said, honey, I've, um, I'm in atrial fibrillation, which is something to do with the heart. Mm. And I said, nah. <laughs> and she said, have a feel. And so I was driving the car, so I reached over and I felt her carotid artery I said, honey, you're in, obs- you're in atrial fibrillation. <laughs> he said, yes, honey, that's what I said. She was right, you know. Yeah. And so she, the way she fixed that is by instead of having a regular coffee, has half a coffee, mm. right? Uh, and so that's enough to not set her off in at- atrial fibrillation. So there are uh. all drugs are poisons. They all have side effects. But overwhelmingly, if you're going to give up anything to get healthy, whatever that is, uh, don't give up coffee. But if it has specific effects like atrial fibrillation or you yeah, can't sleep at night or urination all night, well, that's a different thing. Yeah, nice. Well, I guess that... That was in my 38 <laughs> book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which you didn't read, like a knife into the heart. <laughs> that's probably next, next on the on list. Agenda, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess a, a, a big uh, follow-up question. Having heard you on the radio, random people calling in um, every week and they're always asking random questions. How do you know so much? How do you learn so much? Why are you so curious? How do you ah. remember everything? Which one of those five questions? Will I have? <laughs> okay. Why am I so curious? I don't know. I'm lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good to be curious because as a survival characteristic back over the last couple of hundred thousand years, that'll probably keep you alive longer. Not so important now. Mm-hmm. Um, how did I learn so much? I was lucky because um, I come from a time when uh, the Australian government saw education as a worthwhile investment in the future rather than something to be privatised to earn money for big business. Mm-hmm. And so I've got 28 years of education, including 15 years at university, for free. Thank you very much for paying for my tax, Australians. <laughs> and um, that includes degrees in physics and mathematics, and then another degree in biomedical engineering. I've got a master's degree in biomedical engineering. I built a machine. The machine picks up electrical signals off the human retina to diagnose certain types of eye disease. You know how you can pick up electrical signals off, say, the heart mm. to pick up heart disease? Mm-hmm. Well, you can pick up certain things off the wow. signal from the human retina. I, I built this machine for Fred Hollow, so I was working oh, wow. for him for a couple of years. And then I have degrees in medicine and surgery, so I worked as a doctor in the kids' hospital uh, for a bunch of years. And um, I also have non-degree years of study because I thought my education was lacking, in, so I needed to round myself off. So I've got single years of study in astrophysics, uh, electrical engineering, engineering, philosophy, and computer science. Mm. But that's only the beginning of my education. The education (laughs) then continues, part two, uh, with reading my way through $10,000 worth of scientific literature every year, which is a pile, a metre thick every month. (laughs) And then the third part is then writing stories. So you can read all this stuff, but it's all running around your head in a crazy, unformed fashion. So the height of Mount Everest is four metres, or is it 2,000, or is it 20? You know, there's all this fuzzy stuff. And so I force myself to turn it into stories. I do four of these stories every week. Um, The big ones that I do, the Great Moments in Science, which I've been doing for a third of a century on the ABC uh, program called Great Moments in Science, typically they'll take me between five and 20 hours and so that simple one minute snippet i gave you on coffee mm. that took me eight hours oh wow all right Unreal. so knowledge is mm. a difficult load to pick up but once you've loaded it it's very easy to carry i know that's a strange metaphor no. <laughs> yeah. but, and, and the other problem is that as new knowledge comes in uh the old knowledge gets pushed out of the other side yeah a bit. So your curiosity goes in such a wide wide range. Is what fascinates you the most today? Everything, everything in science. Like I was in my latest book. There's a story about how I can improve my mental function. Maybe if I was a mouse. Yeah. And so it uh, talks about how uh, marijuana can improve mental functioning in older animals. Mm. Yeah. And the exact opposite for younger ones. It was leading to early schizophrenic signs. Is that right? Am I remembering correctly? That's a different study. That's a, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you, the way it works is that um, as you get older, uh, your body face, so like, I'm not going to make any assumptions about your ages, but if you're, 24, on average, 26. if you're 24 and 364 days old, 
you can go out for the weekend and party and have a 15-day weekend, consume your own body weight in illegal pharmaceuticals, have no sleep, live entirely on saturated fat and turn up to work on Monday and people say, hey, Adam, you're looking good. How's the weekend? If you're 25 and one day old, if you stay up to watch Late Line on the ABC past 9 o'clock, the next day people say, man... You look you wrecked. <laughs> what have you done to yourself? So basically, your body decays once you've passed the ability to have children, you know, 25 or something. But the same happens to your brain. So they want to find out, with, for various reasons, what happened with mice. So they've got mice of different ages, young, mature, and older, and then implanted little pumps in their tummies, in their per- peritoneal cavities, which leaked either salt water or cannabis. Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, I believe it's called. And they leaked it in at three milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. And it is for tw- they did this for 28 days, and then they tested them before and after. Mm. And um, with regard to mental functioning going down, it does. And they had a controlled group, of course. And um, we, we were the mice who were, getting, who were old and... Uh, who weren't getting the cannabis, and they give them memory traps and memory tricks and um, working out things like how do you work your way through this puzzle so you don't drown and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Basically, if, if you're an older mice on cannabis, you performed as well as a younger mouse. Wow. If you're a younger mouse on cannabis, you're kind of off your face. Uh, we'll yeah. get back to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> they looked at the brains... And in the, as you get older, the number of synapses of one nerve joining to another just drops off dramatically. With the older mice, um, they got uh, the same as y- uh, younger mice. Mm. As you get older, you stop making proteins. Your DNA doesn't work as well with the older mice on cannabis. They work just as well. Now, there are a, a few little disclaimers here. Oh, so it's due to the endocannabinoid system which you might not have heard of. Have you heard of that? No. Uh, only in uh, previous interviews with you, yes, <laughs> that I listened to. <laughs> so the big question is how come a chemical from a plant, mm-hmm. which is made from plant, can affect an animal, which is made from meat? <laughs> yeah. And it's because of a coincidence. So you might have heard of things called endorphins. Mm-hmm. That actually stands for endogenous, meaning natural within the body, morphine. Mm-hmm. Endogenous morphine, okay. endorphin. Yeah. And we discovered about... Oh, in the 1980s, that your body makes opiates. And the upshot of that is that opium can kill pain. Opiates can kill pain. Your body also makes its own natural cannabinoids, which cover, oh, my God, everything, from <laughs> the immune system to the inflammatory response to growing new nerves, everything. And, and, and apoptosis, the programmed death of uh, cells. And so the natural history of um, your endocannabinoid system is that it doesn't do much between birth and puberty. When you hit puberty until your your early 20s, then it just takes off like crazy. And so there, as you mentioned, that's the problem with having cannabis during that time. You might have a tendency to schizophrenia, which might never appear or might only appear later in life, and cannabis can bring it on earlier and there are other (laughs) bad effects. And then later in life it begins to decay, to decay and so they're thinking with the experiment with the mice that um, having the uh, cannabis in a low dose boosts their endorphin uh, levels to the 18 to 25 year old equivalent nice. but there's a few disclaimers disclaimer number one um, the results were really variable like there were some uh-huh. mice where uh, the older mice where they improved enormously yeah. and other identical older mice that did not Number two, um, mice are not people. So Mm. believe it or not, mice get Alzheimer's disease. We've got a thousand drugs that work on mice with Alzheimer's disease. How many of them work on humans? Maybe three, kind of maybe. Uh, Paracelsus said, number four, all drugs are poisons. What matters is the dose. Mm. And so you should uh, think, not, not act on this now. They are, they are doing human studies now, and they should have the uh-huh. results within five years or so. Yeah, fantastic. That's phenomenal. So that's the kind of story yeah. in my little book there. <laughs> yeah, I awesome. Another thing you talk about in the book is life beyond Earth, which I really liked, and you talk about hydrothermal vents, and uh, I think it was, t- what was the, the, the moon, the Titanus moon? Um, Titan Enceladus. is w- one big moon Enceladus. going around Saturn, the ring planet, which almost certainly has life, but the one you're talking about is Enceladus, yep. and that has a rocky core, maybe 380 kilometres across, surrounded by 10, 20, 30 kilometres of a global ocean, so it's entirely surrounded by ocean, which is then in turn surrounded by ice. Now, the ocean is not liquid sulfuric acid. 
blow me down. It's mm. water. And the ice is not carbon dioxide, it's water. And coming out through holes in the ice at the South Pole uh, at, at a rate of 200 kilograms a second and 2,000 kilometres per hour, uh, the chemicals of life and water and little tiny rocks, 4 to 16 nanometres in diameter. Yeah. And these rocks... The only way that nature makes them that we've been able to find is by having uh, very hot water uh, alkaline flowing over hot rocks, which happens in the hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. What are these hydrothermal vents? Well, we've got about 500 spots on the ocean floor where water squirts out at really high temperatures, up to 400 and something degrees centigrade, and it's carrying with it the minerals in the rock, and it's very hot. And this heat is the basis of the energy supply for an inc- a complete ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So you're going on the ocean floor, float, 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 nothing, dead, 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 and then suddenly, bingo, yeah. there's water, there's this, what they call black or white smokers, where water is squirting out, black or white, with all the chemicals of life in it, and it's really hot, and there's an ecosystem of life 50 to 500 kilo- metres, 50 to 500 metres around it, yeah. And then you keep cruising and there's nothing for the next 100 kilometres. And these ecosystems can have crazy creatures like a worm. The diameter of your thigh, as long as your body without a mouth or an anus, Mm -hmm. and because we're finding these rocks on uh, coming out of these hydrothermal vents on Enceladus, the moon around the ring planet Saturn, almost certainly there are hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor and almost Mm -hmm. certainly... Well, okay, okay. I am, <laughs> I am betting a dollar that we'll find life there. Dollar, F- yeah. Fishy, uh, okay, dollar fifty. <laughs> Fishy type life. So, yeah. on Earth, all life depends on the sun, except for these creatures on the ocean floor. They get their energy supply. They don't need anything from the sun. Mm. Um, all they require is that the ocean is liquid, which you kind of depend on the sun for. But they get their energy from the heat in the hot mm-hmm. water and the, everything they need, the minerals out of the rocks below them. How and when can we confirm this? How far away is that? Well, it depends on how much money you want to spend to get mm-hmm. there, bearing in mind that science is cheap. Like, do you remember the Large Hadron Collider? It's a big, big papa, yeah. Yeah, that was very big, one of the most expensive experiments in human history. It proved the, w- 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 the origin of mass, mm. and um, that was really good because once we've worked out where mass comes from, we can maybe get rid of mass and then travel really fast, but that's a different story. The point was <laughs> that that was um, claimed to be... Uh, very expensive, but it didn't compare it to what? Let me give mm. you a comparison. It was almost, but not quite, as expensive as three warplanes, oh. three B-2 <laughs> bombers, which have got only one job, which is to drop bombs on people and kill yeah. them. Right. And if you live in uh, a society where the press says, oh, that was too expensive, without saying almost as expensive as three warplanes, mm. to put it in perspective, yes. then you're getting a bit of a distorted view. So we need to spend money to go into space, but we have to go into space because... We nearly got wiped out two Halloweens ago. You remember that one? Well, please tell us. Big rock, um, half a kilometre in diameter. And I, I uh, definitely don't remember it. Yeah. You didn't, no, didn't hear about it in the paper? I heard about it, no. No, no. <laughs> the, 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 the newspapers are mainly story papers. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's crap. That's good. But I, I do pay um, 15 bucks a month for the New York Times yeah. and other good papers around the world and get the electronic versions. So... A rock half a kilometre on in diameter missed the Earth by that much, that much being about, uh, I think, 10 or 15 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. It was so big, it had its own Moon going around it. <laughs> if, now, now, putting that, in, putting, putting that into perspective, that was half a, over half a kilometre in diameter, something 10 kilometres in diameter when it landed on Earth in the Gulf of Mexico uh, 65 million years ago, created a hole that was not uh, 10 kilometres deep, but 30 kilometres deep. Mm. That's about nearly four times the height of Everest mm. and 200 kilometres across. <sighs> that's a hell of a hole. That's a big now, hole. depending on where this thing would have hit, uh, for example, the Yellowstone or Naples mm. potential supervolcano site or the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, or the uh, middle of Australia, it would have had different outcomes. Yes. But depending, they reckon it could have killed between 10 and 50% of the human race <laughs> in the first couple of hours and another 10 to 40% over the next couple of weeks. I mean, wow. we, we live in cities, right? How do you get into a supermarket? Electricity. Uh, all gone. Just, just mm. imagine. And do you have a, any proof? Do you have any money apart from mm. what you learn electronically through your smartphone and your computer? Do you have a 
a, a paper passbook that somebody wrote in ink that you got $44? Nah. No, no. Mate, lose electricity, the society crumbles, and uh, the farmers had survived, but the majority of the people in the cities would die very quickly. Wow. <laughs> so, and we missed that, so we have to become a space-going race as part of yeah. our future uh, yeah. survival that we have to do. So if we're travelling, I say, if we're a space-going race, we're going to, the, say, the next galaxies and... The, oh, sorry. Oh, galaxies. Maybe, that's next, jump. next star, sorry. Maybe yeah. that's the first step. <laughs> Um, you know, it's light years away at the moment, which I don't know you'd know how many billions of kilometers away or whatever. Is there an absolute limit on how fast we can actually travel to be able to get there? Or do you think we can actually maybe in our lifetime see some, some you know, really fast space travel? Yes and no. Um, we're limited to incredibly small speeds by uh, chemical rockets. Um, you can go faster with iron rockets where you get electricity from somewhere and you use that electricity to heat up heavy atoms and you throw them out the back. And we've used them to accelerate us up and go out into the asteroid belt mm -hmm. and then nudge up to a big asteroid about a 1,000 kilometres in diameter, orbit it for a year, and then fire up the iron engines and then take off to the next asteroid and then do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. um, but they've got very slow acceleration, but it just keeps on building up. What well, we really need are fusion rockets, which is what the sun runs on. The sun burns up 620 million, million tons of stuff every second of hydrogen. Not 620 tons, 620 million tons a second. <laughs> yeah. Now, if we can get fusion rockets, I reckon we could get up to 10% of the speed of light without too much uh, of a difficulty. Wow. And that would mean that the nearest star is only 40 light years 40 years away 40 years, yeah. Yeah. and so you just put them all to sleep and then they wake up when they get there and um <laughs> the people behind on earth well that's a different story they miss out they some of the well that, that's another story because i reckon that in our generation um you'll begin to see the treatments coming down within your generation of um heading towards immortality because you've got 400 different cell types in your body and they're all programmed to die apoptosis mm. by the way one of the things controlled by the endocannabinoid system. Apoptosis literally means in Greek, the falling of the leaves in autumn off the trees. Your cells are programmed to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you can find those programs and switch them off, you've got a potential lifespan, I'm reckoning, of 500 to 5,000 years with a healthy 18 to 25 year old body. So you'll grow older at one second per second, one year per year, one decade per decade, and in your lifetime the treatments will come online mm -hmm. and you'll find your lifespan increasing enormously, but with a healthy to 18, uh, healthy 18 to 25 year old body. So you, you guys could well be in the first generation to live forever, whereas I'll be probably in the last generation to die. I'm cool, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're we're living so much longer and i heard of something um quite recently like fermi's paradox so if there's so many you know um habitable places or earth-like planets all, all over the solar system and the, oh, sorry the galaxy and everything like that then where are they if there's so many millions of civilizations out there wouldn't have they traveled to us by now do you think that is Fermi's paradox. Where are they? Um, there's a few answers to that, that uh, intelligent life is different from life, mm -hmm. uh, and it takes a lot to get intelligent life. So for us to become intelligent, uh, think back to 7 million years ago when we split off from the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And one of the major mutations was that we had to lose body hair. By losing, if you've got body hair, it's terrific. It gives you protection against the sunburn and the cold, but you have to eat a lot of stuff to get enough protein mm. to extrude this protein out of your body, which is never recycled. Mm -hmm. The moment that you have a mutation where you lose most of your body hair, apart from some in the furry bits and your eyebrows and your skull, yeah. um, you then have that protein available to go into the brain. Okay, mutation number one. Mutation number two, to make room for the bigger brain, you've got to lose the back teeth. You've got to have another mutation. You've got to have a slower jaw. You've got to use, do something with that brain. Uh, the important thing is that you have to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have speech. And if you go back 600,000 years, we're fairly sure that Homo heidelbergensis, who came before Homo sapiens sapiens, we're pretty sure they had speech looking by the indentations in the insides of the skulls of where the speech areas are. But to have oh. speech, you need a few different mutations, yeah. and one of them is that the larynx has to shift position so that you can have well-modulated sounds rather than uh and ah. Uh, you have to be able to say <laughs> apple, constitution, yeah. and, and complicated things like that. And so as we're working our way up, I'd say, okay, Adam 1, 
you go on that side of the dinosaurs and yell at them, and Adam too, you go on that side of the dinosaurs and yell at them, and I'll go in the middle and yell at them, and we all yell at them, and they run away and they fall over a cliff, then we all meet at the bottom and eat. Mm. Right? <laughs> and, and a party. And so you, you need language. So getting intelligent life is really hard. Uh, uh, number two, intelligent life can not survive. Mm. And this can happen either through environmental disasters mm. or by killing itself. Mm. Environmental disaster, uh, 70,000 years ago in Indonesia, Mount Toba exploded mm. and turned into Lake Toba, threw a 1,000 cubi cubic kilometres of dust into the atmosphere, cooled the world down by several centigrade degrees in the middle of an ice age, oh. and the total population of humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, mm. dropped down to 2,000. What? Really? Wow. All the females came from those females. All the males today came from one male. It wasn't as though one guy mm. just said, hey, you 999 other guys, just go and build a fence while I go and check out these curvy things. But there were <laughs> many lines of descent, all of which faded out. Uh -huh. So you and I and the midget or the dwarf Kalahari Bushman and the Chinese and the Inuit, uh, we, we were all, and the Maori, we, we were all going back to one guy. We couldn't, it was possible that we could have been wiped out. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Also, oh, we're doing yeah. bad things to our own environment. For example, mm. with regard to coral reefs, the coral reefs are dying because we're heating up the world. So, with the global warming thing, uh, we're dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so much that every day the amount of heat that used to get into space but no longer does is now bounced down to the mm. kept in the atmosphere the amount of heat that's uh, trapped every day is equal to the heat output of 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs Whoa. of that Whoa. heat it doesn't stay uh, uh, only 7% stays in the air 93% goes into the oceans if it stayed in the air the air temperature would be about 70 degrees C and we'd all be dead mm. but luckily in the short term, it goes into the oceans, but the oceans are heating up and the coral reefs are dying. Mm. Now, the coral reefs make up one-tenth of one percent of the total floor area of the ocean, 25% of all the fish we kill and mm. eat. Yeah. What craziness is it to destroy your food supply, yeah. mm. right? And then there's all other things we're doing with various um, pesticides and chemicals. And uh, I'm optimistic, though. I reckon we'll get through. But what we need with this global warming thing is to have a major paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. The global warming thing, I reckon, uh, and we can go into this another time because it's a big story, the global warming thing, I reckon, within 10 years, if we wanted to, if we wanted to, we could have all of our electricity coming entirely from renewables. The example I yep. give is the 7th of December 1941 when Pearl Harbor happened. And within two years, the American car factories were no longer making cars but were pumping out war materials. Now, the B-17 bomber was this huge thing, 30 tonne, could fly to Perth and from Sydney to Perth, um, crew of 10 people. And they were pumping these out not... And about half, the, uh, roughly equal to the area of an Olympic swimming pool, um, if you bent it in half. And if you, and, and the number that they were pumping out was not one a month, it was one an hour. Wow. Right, one an hour. Wow. So, firstly, it was just the political will. So, I'm saying get, run it yeah. for politics. So, um, we could go, get all of our electricity entirely from renewables for the whole world within 10 years. Transport, which is a bit harder, 15 years. Agriculture is a more difficult one because it's bloody life and it's going to fight us. But mm -hmm. that'll take about 45 years. And then we can go to the next stage and then pull the carbon dioxide back from the atmosphere. So, not only can we not put any mm. carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is turning out to cause global warming. We can also remove what's there, and there's biological pathways, uh, many of which are one time, and then there's, so you, you get the benefit in one go. So there's one method involving fungicide, a, a fungus on plants to make them draw more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and deposit it in the ground in a form that won't come out again. And with that, we can drop the CO2 level down by 60 parts per million. Yeah, wow. But that's and, a once-a. And then uh, growing forests and so forth gives a, a benefit, but that's only a, a, sort of like a once or a twice a benefit. Uh, and then there's machines that um, in, they're testing in Switzerland right now, and even in, in their early form, 25 million of them would pull out 
the entire human race's contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere per year, and you think 25 million is a big number, we make 100 million cars a year. Mm. Right. We just need the political will. Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah. with regard to the Fermi paradox, uh, we have to stop poisoning our nest. The third possibility, so we've gone down two nested layers, yeah. and yeah. then the third one is that they're just looking at us and just keeping away from us until we finally get to the moon and then we become a space-going race and they say, welcome to the Federation. Um, I find <laughs> yeah. that one fairly hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if, the, if, if the aliens wanted to um, avoid... Being, uh, making contact with us, they're doing a really uh -huh. bad job because uh, everybody, there's, there's all these stories about people seeing them, which seem to peak in good synchrony with alcohol drinking in <laughs> the local country. <laughs> and so if they want to remain... Man, <laughs> sorry? Probably at Burning Man Festival, it probably peaks, I could imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so if they want to remain hidden from us, they're doing a bad job. And if they want to make themselves known to us, they're doing a bad job. All they have to do is just land on a football stadium when there is a, there's a match on and there's cameras running. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to believe... So where are they? Uh, we don't know. A fourth possibility, they've transformed. So do you guys read science fiction? No, no, not really. purely non -fiction. I think you were perfect. <laughs> the first chink in your armour. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so... With science fiction, uh, you might want to read something by Alastair Reynolds' Space okay. Opera, it's called, where space opera is this genre not where the future is black and it rains a lot and there's vampires coming out of the ground and everybody dies and can we make a movie series out of it? Mm. But it's a bit deeper than that. And so he sees the human race as going forward, still limited by the speed of light overwhelmingly. I didn't answer that question. Remind me to answer that question. Um, still limited by the speed of light and mutating itself via genetic mutations into different forms that can survive in space and we, we become very different creatures. Mm. Um, and then Freeman Dyson takes it one step further that we become a space-going race with our naked flesh, the naked flesh being that we turn ourselves into a cloud of iron vapour weighing 50 kilograms, the diameter of a planet floating in space. Wow. You don't have to... I mean, what makes you human <laughs> is not your skin colour or your religion or how many arms and legs you've got. It's the fact that you can talk to me. You have a conversation yep. with me, you're human, as far as I'm concerned. That's yep. good enough. You're one of me. Um, and then, then in that case, they will have mutated, evolved themselves into a much better form. Like, I mean, consider the meat bag that we live in. Mm -hmm. Oh, man... If God was involved with the design, I would have what was pretty stuff like that. Like the hip joint, I like. Yep. The knee joint just stuffs um, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, retina. Give me a break. Like you've got the blood vessels in front of the retina behind, and everywhere you look through the body, you think, well, it's good enough they can have babies. That's kind of about <laughs> it. You know, it's not really, a, really that, that good a body. So th th that's another reason for why they might not come here. Now, you were also mentioning before um, travel, space travel. Yeah. There is a way to go faster than the speed of light. Uh, it's called the Alcubierre effect, A-L-C-U-B-I-E-R-R-E. -R -R -E. And what it relies upon is um, distorting the fabric of space-time. Mm. Now, let's just do a little nested diversion, go off to the side and then come back again. Um, all of our astronomy looks at what travels on the fabric of space-time. Visible light, ultraviolet, X-ray, gamma ray, infrared, radio, microwave. And recently we've invented a new form of astronomy called uh, gravitational wave astronomy where we look at ripples in the actual fabric of space-time. Mm. So what that means is, number one, we're, I think we've detected five of them so far. Number, number one, we can detect ripples in the fabric of space-time. Number two, the next stage, we make ripples in the fabric of space-time. You can see what we're, I'm heading for here, the hoverboard and back to the future, obviously. So you can levitate yourself. But um, the other thing is the Alcubierre effect. Now imagine that you're in Sydney and you want to go to Perth. Well, normally you have to traipse across all those many thousands of kilometres of the fabric of space-time. No, no, what you do <laughs> is you just simply get the bit of space-time between you and Perth and you shrink it down to nothing. You get the bit of fabric of space-time between you and Sydney and you expand it. Suddenly you're in Perth in zero time. Not at, <laughs> not at, not at, not at the speed of light time, zero time. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a few Fantastic. problems. Number one, yeah. I've got no idea how to do it. Yeah. Um, number two, theoretically it does seem that if you could get it to work, 
that as you uh, arrived in zero time at your destination, um, you would obliterate it with a shock cone. Is that with momentum of the... Or well, he, I don't know the physics, but basically wherever you're coming to, you destroy it. Oh. It kind of makes it pointless trying to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> if you destroy it by going there, yeah. So, so there's a few problems. This is just early days. This is we just work on engineering it. and theoretical problems. We'll work around it in the yeah. same way that we've now got computers that you can access. Mm. And that's this crazy world we're in, that on your smartphone, you have access to the best, highest quality peer-reviewed literature ever available to any human in the history of the human race. And we still believe crap like coffee is bad for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I love it. Well, I like how we touched on um, global warming in there. I'm glad to hear that there's hope if... Um, you, you have to go into politics. And yeah. um, the thing is to not think it's a bad idea. So one of the best things that John Howard, the ex-Prime Minister of Australia, did to spread this, to do the cover-up, was do you remember there was that year where he spent a lot of time walking around in pastel-coloured jumpsuits? I thought that was every year. <laughs> well, he also spent a very large percentage of Australia's gross domestic product on submarines that could not be built. Mm. Why? Why did he do that? don't know why, but he did. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're going down the same pathway again. Now, if you want to stop, uh, when I say could not be built, yeah. um, uh, building a submarine is technically very complex. And yes, Australia can build submarines, but you can't do it right now. You've mm -hmm. got to work your way up. It's like you want to um, make a radio. Sure. Well, here's a soldering iron and here's some transistors and you don't know how to solder. So you've got to teach them how to solder. So you've got to work our way up. We can develop. We can make submarines. You just can't do it first off. It's mm -hmm. at the end of a long chain of learning. Yep. And... Um, so the way I'm suggesting is that people should go into politics because there's, there are even people in politics today in Australia who uh, got there with 19 votes, mm. Um, wow. mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. Yeah. And you guys would do a much better job. Uh, I ran for politics in 2007. Did you vote for me? I wasn't old I was enough. A, yeah, I wasn't old enough. Nice either. excuse. Nice <laughs> excuse. Would have. 100% would have. Ah, uh, well, uh, oh, yeah. we didn't get enough um, advertising yeah. because we didn't have a big enough budget mm -hmm. and so people didn't know. So what I'm saying is go into politics. As Lyndon B. Johnson said, uh, you're better off on the inside of the tent pissing out than the outside pissing out. <laughs> yeah. And if, if you think that you don't get into <laughs> politics because they're all crooked, that's the re exact reason you should go in yeah. there. If you believe they're all crooked... Hmm. why aren't you in there being the one vote out of a couple of hundred that is not crooked? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why just let them run the country? And why just stand by shouting at the TV? So I'll quote here as my role model, the man with that splendidly Victorian name, Barnaby Joyce, who turned out, unfortunately, to be a double agent for the yeah. New Zealand government. And I think they've got to change all the passcodes in Parliament House to get to the toilets now that, that <laughs> secret information is now available to the New yeah. Zealand government. But anyway, the way he got into power was he went around Queensland for four or five years. And he said, now, you two Adams? And he'd grab you and he'd sit in the pub with you and he'd talk to you for two hours. Anything you want, I will do. Mm. Just vote for me. Mm. And then you go down the road and say, hey, you, Carl, and Michael and Muriel, whatever you want, I'll do. And he talked to you for a couple of hours. And he did that every day for four or five years, wore out a couple of car engines travelling around Queensland, got into the Senate, then into the lower house, then into being the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and then got flicked because he was a, a foreign agent. Mm. But the point was, he got into Parliament. If you think you can do a better job, Go for Parliament. That's where the power is. I try to run for Parliament because I have got influence. Yep. Mm. With you guys, I've got influence. Definitely. I've got zero power. I cannot pass a single law that changes anything. The only people who can change the law, for example, that Australia goes entirely renewable for electricity, are politicians. Yep. That's where the power is. Go for the power and be good. But it's a hard run. Like you see Barnaby Joyce sitting by himself just trying to recover and he looks exhausted the poor bugger all politicians work really long hours and so you'll be there at six o'clock in the morning for the raising of a flag at the rsl and then 11 o'clock at night at some high school dance it's really hard work people will call you crooked they'll tell lies about you but you have a chance to do something good for australia yeah phenomenal i think we really need it now because i saw you on twitter posted recently about the carmichael coal mine in adani which is i think it's going to be 
you know, 75 million tons of coal every year. It's going to oh be about God. one to one and a half percent of the world emissions. Oh God. And that's opening in 2020 with a supposedly 60 year design life of, of coal. So, and, you know, I've got no idea how, um, you know, projects like this start coming through when, you know, renewables are the obvious choice in 2020. Well, the bottom line is global warming is real and it's getting really bad already and it's just going to get worse. And we have to not go down the same pathway, but in fact reverse, stop putting carbon dioxide and start sucking out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so the Adani coal mine has what's been technically called a royalty holiday. What that means is that they don't have to pay for the royalties on the coal they take out. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd... It's no, I, I don't want a tax holiday. I like paying yep, tax, but I wouldn't mind a coffee holiday where, and I wouldn't mind a movie holiday where whenever I get a coffee or a movie, that's free. I wouldn't mind a car holiday where someone gives me a free Tesla, and um, I wouldn't mind a magazine holiday where people give me free magazines. I wouldn't mind if people give me everything for free, um, and yet for one, mm. not only are we giving them a tax free a tax holiday on royalties we're also putting in a billion dollar coal mine a billion dollar railway line and if we put that billion dollars into directly health education welfare or even on protecting the great barrier reef mm. we'd get more jobs mm. they're saying in the press releases i'll get 10,000 jobs in court they said 1,000 jobs and <laughs> when, you, when when you compare that like, like there's a windmill factory starting up in South Australia. By itself, 600 jobs. Mm. Okay, count the number of people who've been booted off the land by the Adani coal mine mm. and you're getting close and the jobs that are lost there, you're getting already close to the 1,000 mm. jobs that they'll create. It's the craziest thing that seems to... You've got to take it to the high level and the high level is that global warming is real mm. and this can't go ahead because it'll make global warming worse. Yeah. The crookedness along the way... well. That's why you should become a politician. Yeah, that sounds absolutely Follow the ridiculous. example of Barnaby Joyce. You don't have dual citizenship, do you? I do. Oh, you're out, mate. Yeah, well, well, I'm good. well it's the other Adam. It's on me. <laughs> the, it's a handsome Adam. Go on, mate. That's too funny. Um, you mentioned Tesla. Did you see Elon just releasing the new Roadster and the Semi as well? Yeah, he's heading he down the, the right pathway. Um, and he's doing it purely from the economics point of view. The thing, the thing is that we've got this disruptive technology which is being stopped by the old school. So with regard mm. to global warming, uh, they're telling lies about it. Why? Let me explain. In 1973, the world's largest insurance company, reinsurance company, Munich Ray, saw that global warming, as they called it, the greenhouse effect back then, mm. was um, causing increased insurance costs. Mm. They could see it. Mm -hmm. And so they said, okay, we're going to charge you more. In the same way that before the doctors recognised it, the insurance companies realised that smoking shortened your <laughs> lifespan. It was bad for your health, so they've got to charge you more. Yeah. Uh, nothing personal, it's just business. They could see it. It took the scientists from 73 to 88, 89, because they have a higher burden of proof, proof to show that global warming was real and that we caused it and it was going to be bad. Then there was a soft period for about a year when the fossil fuel companies did nothing. Follow up the emails on the New York Times, and the fossil fuel companies basically said among themselves, we've got two options. Either we recognise that this greenhouse effect is real, we are in the business of making energy, we happen to do it by burning carbon, let's stay in business as energy companies, but go into something mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. We're still energy companies, but not just by burning carbon. We'll, nice. we'll transition right now. Or, number two, let's cover up using a massive disinformation campaign <laughs> following from our good friends in the tobacco company and do business as usual. Even today, tobacco companies say that smoking cigarettes to, is not addictive and doesn't cause oh, harm. No, Even no. today. And these are people. like I, yeah. Right. Yeah. These, these are humans like you <laughs> yeah. and me. Um, and so that's why you should go into politics so you can pass the laws. Nice. Um, was, you've been extremely generous with your time and I'm, we've got heaps and heaps of questions that we can oh, ask. Oh, well, let's get through them all, faster all, then. Day, all day and all day. One thing I liked, uh, I've seen you posting on Twitter a little bit, the BAF, the Bulldust Asymmetry Factor. That's where, a polite way of calling it. Yeah, where, yeah, <laughs> uh, where people post ridiculous things and uh, it takes longer to disprove them than for them to just say them, whether yeah. it's... Uh, 
what, what are some of the ridiculous things that people ask you regularly? Well, a typical sentence will be, and I'm looking at the clock now, uh, the climate on Earth has always <laughs> changed, so we don't need to worry about it changing, and the carbon dioxide level has always gone up and down, and global warming isn't real. That was seven seconds yeah. to <laughs> disprove that. Okay, first you talk about the climate changing. You have to talk about the ice ages mm -hmm. and how they come in pulses of roughly 150 million years mm -hmm. as the sun goes around the big black hole in the middle of our galaxy, oscillating up and down through the dust cloud. Then every 150 million years you have a pulse of these ice ages. Then you have to bring in the Milanka... I'm already up to 20 seconds. Yeah, so the, <laughs> you're already so well into the So the, yeah. <laughs> the bull dust asymmetry factor of any lie is huge. And what they do is they, the denialists, they pick four or five of the biggest lies and they give them all very quickly in 10 seconds. And it takes a lot longer to disprove mm -hmm. it. Yeah. yeah, that's ridiculous. What are some of the other silly ones? I saw, I think that I saw... Uh, oh, the Spartan causes cancer. Oh, the flat earthers. But there's still people today who believe that coffee is bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the or, listeners, uh, I quit coffee last week, so... <laughs> or, the, or the gluten diet. Yeah. Like, like the number of people who truly uh, have celiac disease is about 1%-ish but it exists in different forms from soft to fairly hard. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think that they have um, some sort of celiac disease um, and they have bloating symptoms. And when you put them on a double-blind study, which is expensive, and then you have them having their regular diet, then you have six weeks of absolutely no gluten whatsoever. And then over three weeks, you give them... Uh, either a placebo or gluten, gluten for one week, then mm -hmm. a washout for one week, and then either the gluten or a placebo for one week, only one in six have the symptoms that they claim. Oh, I get gluten whenever I have gluten. Oh, I get bloating whenever I take two. Hit a point. <laughs> I have bloating, they say, whenever <laughs> I have gluten. And then you just tell them, well, you've been having gluten for the last week and you've had no bloating. And then suddenly they say, oh, I can suddenly feel it coming on now <laughs> and blow me down, it does. They <laughs> have the placebo effect where they want to believe it. So, the, so is, is gluten not bad for you? Because Adam's off gluten as well. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. <No>. Sometimes. <laughs> no. I've been hearing it off the wrong people, it seems. <laughs> you tell me you're kidding. <laughs> I'm serious. You're giving up uh, both gluten. I love... Okay. Here's so gluten's a, good. I'm, no. As yeah. of today, back, <laughs> well, 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 gluten, back on gluten. Gluten has um, <laughs> two different proteins in it, which... Allow uh, sort of stringy and long, and they allow wheat and rye and barley mm. to go into many different forms. So, with regard to wheat, you can turn it into a cake or bread or pasta. In some, in about one percent of people, uh, it sets off an immune reaction, which then organizes the body's own immune system to go and destroy the microvilli. Okay, so you've got a gut. The gut is a tube about 10 metres long, but the surface area is increased to about 200 square metres by all these little, little fingers called yeah. microvilli. Mm -hmm. Okay, you shear them off. They're gone. You don't do absorption. And so you get the lack of nutrition, lack of absorption of food, uh, malnutrition, um, bloating, gas, diarrhoea. This happens to 1% of people. In Australia, roughly 25% of people think, that they need to go on a gluten-free diet. They then have food which is more expensive, higher in fat, higher in salt, higher in sugar, and less nutritious. So they're paying two to three times as much for food that is worse for them, and overwhelmingly they tend to put on weight with time following the studies. Mm. Okay. So, um, just with health, Carl, let's just say there's, there's so many books having, you know, and so many people saying completely different things. It's really hard to know what is consistent with when it comes to health for people. Um, and that's why hmm. uh, when I was 32, uh, I stopped reading one science fiction book a day, as was my habit, and then gave it up so I could start loading what you need for medicine. And after 10 years of loading information in your brain, you, you finally begin to understand something. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it's not easy. Yeah. The, the, and there are many uh, people out there who are prepared to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. So there's a few books there called um, Wheat 
Belly is is one of them, um, and so a couple of the books talk about the the gluten thing. For example, they'll look at a study looking at people with Alzheimer's disease, and it found that in their terminal stages, they they, they, they quote a study which, and according to the scientists who did the study, what it does show is that the people with Alzheimer's disease when they've already got it tend to have a higher blood sugar level. This thing gets turned around into if you eat wheat, your blood sugar level will go down and it will cause um, Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, another claim made in these books is that now uh, when wheat, when the proteins in wheat break down, they break down into uh, chemicals very similar to the endorphins, and that's why wheat is addictive because it's an opiate. Mm. These chemicals also are made by fruit and meat and vegetables. Number two, <laughs> they've never proved to be uh, landing on the receptor sites to cause the addiction. So there are so many people out for a quick buck yeah. um, and trying to sell these... Take two. There's so many people out for a quick buck telling lies in books. Yeah, that's phenomenal. <laughs> so but where do you get things. your hard information from? No. Um, I tend to go for academic sites. So with regard to food, um, many people think they're experts because they've got a mouth and they eat this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, in medicine, in my training in medicine, in my six years of training, just where they're basically loading your brain up with bits and pieces of stuff. And so you, you don't know much, right? Like you know a little bit of histology and you know a little bit of pathology and a little bit of biochemistry and a little bit of anatomy and a little bit of physiology. If you want to be an expert in any of those fields, it's 10 years, right? You know mm-hmm. just enough sure. to diagnose somebody. The amount of training I got in dietetics, eight hours. The amount of training a dietitian gets, four years. See a dietitian. Trust <laughs> them, right? They're the yeah. experts. You ask me a dietary advice, if I've really checked it hard and checked with a dietitian, and if that's what I am confident that the average opinion of dietitians is, mm-hmm. I'll quote that and hope that I quote it correctly. Yeah. But in general, my advice is, mate, I'm not an expert. See the dietitian. Yeah, yeah. phenomenal. That's not nice. real. Um, what about lactose? Are you giving up lactose? No, I haven't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? With, um, yeah, go on. I'm I was going to ask, as, as I guess we're going toward the end now, what books do you, do mm. you read or have been influential on your life? Um, everything. Yeah. Um, the Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker, showing that we are living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the human race. Oh, wow. wow. So um, Beyond Piketty. There's an economics book uh, talking about the claim by Piketty, who is uh, an economist specialising in tax returns from centuries past. And he worked out that, firstly, that there's a massive shift of money from the poor to the wealthy. And that, secondly, the way it's happening is that in any, if you're looking at the income being paid to humans, the amount of income being paid from investments is increasing Mm. and the amount of income being paid uh, from wages is decreasing. Mm. So the workers get screwed and so the rich get richer and the poor get shorter, right? Um, And then, oh, Econobabble by Richard Dennis. He is fantastic. And so he talks about economics and you'll, surprisingly, you'll find that most of the politicians in parliament are not economists. Mm. Yeah nor do they take Mm. the advice of economists, and they say things about economics that are just totally wrong. (laughs) So, for example, um, in Australia, out of a gross domestic product of around $1,500 billion a year, $1,500, we give away as subsidies $135 billion to companies overwhelmingly foreign-owned, and then take it overseas and then do anything they want with it. It's crazy. A hundred... Like, we're trying to give away a billion dollars to Adani. We're trying... We're saying to Adani... (laughs) Take the coal, Come and take everything. but you don't have to pay a royalty <laughs> oh, on yeah. the coal. And by the way, here's a billion dollars. We're, we're providing all the infrastructure, and any money you do make, look, just just hang on to yourself. <laughs> yeah. There was one year. Like oh, there there, there was there. one year where, in my family, my son and my daughter and my wife and I, between us, let me. Get, I think I've got it right. Between us, we paid more tax than Apple and Google and Facebook and Macquarie Bank and BHP combined. <laughs> oh. Oh, and you know how you can stop that? 
No. Going into politics? Yes. <laughs> yes. You have learned well, Grasshopper. Yeah. Uh, the force yeah. is strong in this one. Now, you might not want to go into politics yourself because you might not have the, posi- the personality for it because people are really nasty to you. Mm. But if, if, if not, support somebody mm. who is to help Who's them legit. change things. Yeah. Nice. So, I love it. Well, I guess just to finish off, this is your 43rd book. Um, you're, on, you're on the radio every week, a whole bunch of TV shows. What's the, what are the next projects? And is there a 44th book? Oh, there's 44 and 45 uh, yep. flowing down the pipeline simply because... Because the scientists are producing so much weird stuff. Yep. In fact, thanks to you, Adam on gluten, I'm going to do my <laughs> next story about gluten. So it'll be coming out on my radio show, which I've had for a third of a century on the radio, on the ABC, called Great Moments in Science. Unreal. So I'm yeah. doing it in your honour <laughs> about, about the gluten thing. So that way you'll avoid, you'll, you'll end up with more money. And you'll have a better diet. You won't have food that is more expensive and higher in fat and higher in salt. I feel like I'm going to live another decade because of this. <laughs> I'll, I'll dedicate it to you. I'll try and squeeze in your name by maybe having the first letter of the first four paragraphs spelling out A D A. So you and I will know that it's dedicated to you. That would be an absolute privilege, Carl. Thank you. I know. Thank you for putting me onto that. I've got to do a story about that. You convinced me. I love it. So where can people find more, Dr. Carl? Oh, you go to drcarl.com, D-R-K-A-R-L.com, and here's some more advice. Now, you guys, have you got adam.com? I've got adamashton.com.au, and I've got adamashton.org. Good. And? Adam Jones. There's too many of them. It's too expensive <laughs> yeah, to get Jones. Adam Jones. So, no, I don't have one with my name. How about Adam Jones um, X or Adam X Jones? Dot com. So try and go for the highest level, yep. and that way you've got something where you can have your webs, your email hang off so people can always contact you because you'll be living forever with a healthy yeah. adding <laughs> exactly, to your body. Yeah. So you may as well have an e- email address that doesn't Get fall over. Out, yeah. 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 So I'm um, going to do some more books and uh, continue working at the university. And I've, I've got this uh, project going. If you go to my homepage, you'll see all sorts of uh, free stuff, mm. um, including for school kids, uh, all these stories from great moments in science that they can cut and paste and hand in as our own homework because the teachers haven't heard of the internet yet. <laughs> and there's all these extra podcasts there. And I've got this project going where I'm trying to do free science question and answer sessions with um, 1% of all the schools in Australia each year. Yeah, nice. So um, do ring me at the nice. University of Sydney, ring the University of Sydney, ask for Dr. Carl, and uh, try and line up um, a free science question and answer session. Cost you nothing. Phenomenal. Love it. Dr. Carl, thanks so much. It was phenomenal. Oh, Looking forward to book you. number 44 and 45 yeah. and beyond. Well, I expect to see you in Parliament one <laughs> and the other, Adam. Thank you for the story on the, uh, the gluten thing. I'm very yeah. grateful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Phenomenal. That was awesome. Well, um, we hope you enjoyed that interview. We just wanted to remind you, we've read some bloody good books this season so far and you can win them all. Yep. So we've got a, a prize. So there's three ways you can enter this and it is absolute bonanza. Yeah, mate, it is a bonanza, you know. <laughs> Seven habits highly effective people. If you can grow rich, start with why, to name just a few of the 48 books that you can win. So you can firstly uh, fill out the survey at whatyouwillearn.com slash survey. Very short, two minutes. Yeah, and you can see that in the show notes of all our episodes. The, the second one is leave a review for us. Yeah, we'll find that. And the third way is to just buy a book. Yep. Have a read, send us a picture of the book or the receipt or something at uh, podcast at what you will learn dot com and yeah that's it. you can enter three times three yeah, chances three to times win. each time probably maximum three minutes time investment yeah. and you could land fifty fucking good books which you can use to sell or give us gifts. Yeah good shit.